Yes. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Great to see everyone out there, all your shiny, happy faces, and just lovely to connect in this virtual way in our time of being physically distanced. We can still try to socially connect, which is just so important for our health and wellness. And um, I'm just so excited today to welcome two more of the PD Avengers. Um, this is a really amazing group of people, as you're going to see. I've just been blown away by each and every one of them. I've read their bios and started to learn about their work, and I'm just blown away, as you will be. So um, we have uh, a, actually a, a, a alumni of University of Toronto um, Medical School uh, joining us. Uh, that's where I went. That's my alma mater. And um, Dr. Mathur, Sonia, um, as we'll call her for the rest of the program, uh, was a few years ahead of me in med school and is a fellow Canadian. And um, just excited to have her. She's done so much great advocacy and we'll learn about a little bit about her and um, about all the work that she's done over the last many years um, and also how they came together and um, uh, started the PD Avengers. I'm also thrilled to have Tim Haig, who's another fellow Canadian. He's um, from a little bit farther west um, in Winnipeg um, and who is another Avenger. He's actually um, got a background in nursing and was another sort of advocate, um, just an amazing person. He, you might recognize him as he's been on The Amazing Race Canada. And just uh, both of these guys are just such groundbreaking game changers uh, from an activism standpoint. And hopefully we can encourage some activism and advocacy out there and all of our listeners and uh, just um, excited to learn from them. So uh, I'd love to hear maybe a little bit about you, Sonia, first, a little bit about your background and your Parkinson's journey, what led you to activism? And I know that we have some slides as well, and we'll, we'll continue the discussion about activism throughout this. So. All right, thank you so much for that intro. Um, so as Inda mentioned, I'm a, a physician, I'm a family physician. Uh, I actually went to Dalhousie, but University of Toronto for my residency. So, okay. <laughs> um, so still, still a school I went to. Um, I started my journey with Parkinson's at the age of 28 when I first noticed a, a tremor in my pinky finger. And that was uh, close to 22 years ago. Um, I practiced my family medicine practice for about 12 to 13 years after my diagnosis, had three children during that time as well. And then just basically found myself um, unable to maintain the pace of a, a busy medical practice as well as my health and, and home and family. And so that's when I turned to advocacy and uh, patient education and activism and became, you know, fairly involved with uh, different organizations. I co-chair the patient council at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, on the board of directors for Davis Finney and involved with the Brian Grant Foundation as well and uh, Parkinson's Canada and a number of other uh, boards as well. And that's sort of been, you know, what I thought was a loss of career is actually, um, turned into my life's passion and, and, and speaking about Parkinson's disease and how people can live well with this disease despite the challenges that we face and, and also looking at how we as a, a global group can advocate for um, our community, our community's health, that search for a, a better treatments and a cure has become really important to me. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, when I heard about the PD Avengers, I just, I think Rochelle had shown me something about the idea and then I've just been so excited to see the growth and how much, you know, how many voices are starting to join the movement. And, and I think, well, really, I'm just, I, as soon as I heard about that, I, I talked to Rochelle and wanted to have you, each and every one of you be featured on here. And it's, it's been just amazing to learn about your work. So I so appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Um, oh, and somebody wrote, plus you wrote two books, which we'll hear about too. One of our guests has already highlighted that you, you haven't told us everything about all of your work that you've been doing. <laughs> How about you, Tim? Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, Parkinson's journey, about your background a little bit, and you know what's led you to this moment? Sure. Well, just a shout out to all my fellow Americans, first and foremost. I was born in Texas, raised in Kansas, and grew up in Winnipeg. So follow that transition a little bit. I left home at fairly young, early age, got married pretty young, and moved to Canada where I grew up. <laughs> But nonetheless, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's about uh, this February, will be 10 years ago. I was 46 and uh, started off somewhat similar to Sonia's, a small tremor in my left big toe. And I had been nursing for 18 years at that point, so I knew that you don't wake up on any given morning twitchy in any digit for no good reason. So I was diagnosed a couple of months later and uh, 
46 years old, had Parkinson's disease. Uh, spent the first year kind of blown away, a uh, little in shock and terror and a little bit of anger, like I guess a lot of us are when we're first diagnosed. But during that time, my son and I had also um, followed my wife's advice and applied for the Amazing Race Canada. And in the end, my diagnosis with Parkinson's is what actually got us on the show. And despite our, my Parkinson's and our absolutely dismal ability to read a map, we somehow hung in and won the doggone thing. So that has provided us an incredible opportunity to share our story, talk about Parkinson's in far more places than I would have had the opportunity otherwise. And it's given me a real platform to shine a light on, especially young onset Parkinson's disease, and to pursue some of the things that I'm passionate about, uh, specifically sports and exercise. That's what led us to uh, found U-Turn Parkinson's. We, we talk a lot about exercise and the need to be active within Parkinson's. But at least here in Winnipeg, there was nothing for people with Parkinson's. You, you either had to go on your own to the gym or wing it with some friends or whatever, but there was nothing specifically organized for people with Parkinson's. So I said, we got to change that. So we got together a board and some friends, and we now have been four years later with U-Turn Parkinson's, a wellness center, center dedicated to helping people with Parkinson's live well. And there's much more that we can talk about, but those are kind of the highlights for now, along with the, now the PD Avengers of the last few weeks, which I am super excited to say, we just crossed the 500 mark of 500 members of the PD Avengers this week, and we are just weeks into this. So it's super exciting to see how the community has taken this on. That's awesome, amazing, proud, proud of you both. Um, so I know you've prepared a few slides just to kind of give us a little bit of a background. So I'd love to have you share those now, and then we'll get a little bit more you know, into some questions, and we'll, we'll see kind of where the conversation takes us. All right. Well, I guess I will take off, Sonia. I'll give you just a little bit of an intro to uh, who the PD Avengers are. We got started after having read this book, which is always at hand for me now, Ending Parkinson's Disease, by a number of good doctors that you would recognize their names, Dr. Ray Dorsey, Todd Shearer, Michael Oaken, Bass, Bass Bloom. And it was a groundbreaking book for a lot of us. We um, we really took to heart a lot of the things that they described there as a prescription for ending Parkinson's disease. I, for one, have never been one that has talked about a cure or ending Parkinson's. I've always been about living well and uh, surviving this thing as well as we possibly can. And this book actually changed my opinion and changed my mind on how to approach what we're doing with Parkinson's disease. A number of us got really excited about what we were reading, that number being specifically Sonia, and uh, Larry Gifford. Larry Gifford kind of brought us together. The three of us started talking. That conversation quickly began to include other people, a number of them that are listed there on the screen. And our first meeting turned into about 15 different uh, advocates from around the world. Uh, you'll see people listed there from England, from Canada, from the United States, and uh, the number of people from around the world has just grown exponentially. That has gotten excited about this idea that we can take and be, come together as a single voice and make ourselves heard around the world on behalf of people with Parkinson's disease. We realize that Parkinson's has been defined for 203 years. It was in 1817 that Dr. James Parkinson's first defined what Parkinson's was. And in that 200 years, we've done all kinds of things. We've put men on the moon. We've uh, turned HIV into a chronic illness from a death sentence. We've done so many incredible things, and yet today we have one medication that's good for most of us, not all of us, most of us, isn't available in about 40% of the, well, it isn't available in a large part of the, of the world. You go to Nigeria, you can't get cinnamon. You go to large, big portions of the world, you can't get this one drug that is our gold standard that we've had for 60 years, and is basically the thing that we've come up with in the last 200 years. We decided that there were a number of things that we wanted to do. We rallied around their pact, the pact from the book, that says that you know, we need to prevent, advocate, care for, and treat Parkinson's differently. We came up with the values of wellness, advocacy, and research for the PD Avengers. And from there, we have said we want to, uh, our, our vision is to simply end Parkinson's, simply. It's a great, big, hairy, audacious goal, we know. It's hard to get your head around, hard to get your hands on. 
but that's ultimately what we want. And our mission, our goal in doing that is to bring together 50 million media Avengers who can stand together and speak with one voice in demanding that Parkinson's is responded to differently than it has been the last 200 years. And where we get that number 50 million from is the fact that um, there's a roughly around 10 million people living with Parkinson's today, probably a conservative estimate. And there's probably four people for every person living with Parkinson's who's impacted by their lives. And that's where we come up with the 50 million. So um, there's the beginning. That's where we started. That's kind of our thinking at this point. And our goal is to simply have a voice. So when we ask you to become a PD Avenger, the biggest thing that we're asking is to lend us your voice, stand with us, and to help us be heard. Sonia? That's yeah, that's great, Tim. I mean, Tim spoke about that broad uh, vision and mission of ending Parkinson's disease. And we had to break it down, obviously, because it's a rather overwhelming task to, to undertake. So we broke it down into three main objectives, which Tim also mentioned briefly. The first objective is to see that all people of the world with Parkinson's have equitable access to not only medications, but information um, and other management strategies. Um, as Tim mentioned, there are so many areas, particularly in Southeast Asia and Africa, that patients just don't have access to simple medications. I can't even imagine living without dopamine replacement, yet there are, it's very common and, and actually the norm in, in a lot of, of, of parts of this world. Our vision is to end PD. That's a global, global issue and it requires a global buy-in. So. Um, addressing inequities in the, in the world of Parkinson's and our Parkinson's community on a global level has been very important to us. Our second objective is to unite a global alliance of, of 1 million advocates to start with. We mentioned 50 million is our ultimate goal. We're gonna start with a million. That seems a little bit more achievable. And we're already at 500, as Tim said, we're making our way there. And with your help, we can really get that, get that going. Um, instead of everyone sort of working in their own silos with their own organizations, with you know the, their own uh, researchers or people that they're familiar with, we feel that in order to address Parkinson's disease, in order to have a chance to end Parkinson's disease, we have to unite. We have to have a united message that all advocates and all researchers and all clinicians are speaking the same language and addressing the same concerns. And, and through that, we feel we can make ultimate change because there is power in numbers. And our third objective is to integrate meaningful patient input at every step of therapeutic development. Patients have the knowledge and the expertise to help in the research development process from the time of inception of where the research should go through to the process of developing the, the, the studies to the implementation, to the dissemination of the information after the studies in order to inform the, the patient community. Um, we have value for that. We, we want a seat at the table and we're trying to work towards, towards um, getting that seat. Um, did you want to add anything at that point, Tim? Yeah, uh, let's see. I didn't have a thought there. I thought I would throw in. I want to give you an example of um, some buddies of mine I was with the other night. They're, they're friends of mine who are tied in close to what I do. They're, they understand my passion about Parkinson's. They get my Parkinson's. They get what I'm trying to do. And I ask them about PD Avengers. And I said, so you guys a PD Avenger yet? And they both said, oh, yeah, I thought I heard about something about that on your website or something you were doing on social media. And the other one said, yeah, what's that about? And I'm like, fail. Abject fail. If I have not gotten the message across to these two guys who we're, who we're pretty tight with, I have not gotten the message across. So I want to just say again, what we are looking for from you is for a million people with Parkinson's who live with Parkinson's, who are impacted by Parkinson's, to stand together, have one voice, so that we can go to government, we can go to pharma, we can go to various organizations, and we can say that we, the people, we, the people who are living with Parkinson's, feel this. This is what we need. We need to be at the table for research. We need to advocate for these things. We need to be able to live well with these resources and we want you to provide them. So you might see us put out polls, you might see us do various surveys, petitions, and just imagine if a million people impacted with Parkinson's came together and said, 
we need this, I believe we can change the landscape of Parkinson's across the world. That's what we're looking for with PD Avengers. And I truly hope that you will get excited with us and that you will join us. That's great. And, th and that sort of speaks to the next thing that um, we were going to talk about, and that's the advocacy pyramid. What's the journey? When we talk about advocacy, what are we talking about? A really um, good friend of mine who unfortunately passed away, um, Tom Isaacs, he was a, um, an advocate extraordinaire. He founded uh, Cure Parkinson's Trust in the UK. And he sort of described the psychological journey that people go through uh, when they're diagnosed with Parkinson's, that sort of journey from despair to fulfillment. The bottom of the, the pyramid is diagnosis. That's of course our own stories and they're varied um, depending on, on person, age and stage of life. Um, the second is shock, anger and denial. And this is, um, People often linger in the stage. I know I did. <laughs> I probably spent a, spent a good, you know, decade in the stage because I just didn't want to accept it. I didn't have the time. It really it was, it was more of a nuisance than anything else. Um, and this is the time where we're looking for emotional support. It's psychologically the worst stage of this illness. It's the most, time we're most introspective. It's the time we build barriers, sort of trying to protect ourselves. We feel like no one knows what we're going through. As we move through that stage, we get into stage of communication. And this is really a key point um, in that transition from misery to, to towards happiness. We begin to disclose to those that um, are close to us, um, begin to pe understand that people don't understand us because we're not telling them how we feel. Um, we don't communicate with them. Communication starts to become therapeutic. It, it, it starts to become important. Um, hope starts to germinate. and. Um, information, we're sort of also in the information collecting um, point at this, at this level. We then move on to acceptance, education, and consolidation, as, as Tom said. And that's another key moment. You begin to accept that Parkinson's is part of who you are. You begin to accept that your life has changed somewhat ir ir irreversibly. You start to alter your ambitions and the way you conduct yourself uh, according to your PD but you also concentrate more on what you can do as opposed to what limitations you have. Um, this is sort of a new positive outlook, outlook and it really needs to be nurtured. We then get to engagement and participation and that's when Parkinson's becomes a wider issue than you alone. You start talking to people, you start sharing, listening to their stories. You look beyond your personal fate. You begin to understand that your own experience and your own um, thoughts may, may help others. And then you get to participate. And that's when we start joining forums and groups and discussions, have discussions with others. We might take a particular interest in a particular aspect, like clinical trials, for example. Our place in society changes and peer-to-peer -peer relationships become very, very important. And then we hit advocacy. And advocacy is sort of when you become a little bit more recognized, people are starting to listen to what you have to say. You're becoming busy in the business of Parkinson's disease. And then influence is where your, your input actually impacts um, patient treatment and care, your insight, urgency, your focus, your passion, fundraising, empathy, all that sort of leads to tangible results. But PD Avengers really is a group for everybody along this journey. It doesn't matter if you're just early in your diagnosis or you're you know, 22 years <laughs> into it like myself. Um, it doesn't matter where you stand on this pyramid, but everyone, everyone has a voice, everyone has a role to play in this, in this um, fight for better treatments and ultimately a cure and to live well while we wait for those treatments and a cure to um, come about. So I just thought I'd share that advocacy pyramid to, to show you that it doesn't really matter, as I said, where you're on in your psycholog psychological journey, you're welcome um, to join us um, to, to, to become a PD Avenger and really help, um, help further our cause. When we looked at uh, starting having the conversation of starting a wellness center here in Winnipeg, uh, U-Turn Parkinson's, and out of, out of interest, you, you might wonder where the term U-Turn Parkinson's comes from. Well, all roads lead back to the amazing race. <laughs> On the amazing race, if you've watched the show, you know there's a U-Turn that's employed. And what it does is you, you come to a spot, there's this board sitting there, there's a bunch of pictures in a box and you can take a picture out 
hanging on the board and you turn another team. And the goal there is to make them, well, the, the point then is they have to go back and perform another task. And so the point of it all is to slow them down and if you're fortunate, eliminate them from the race because the last team to come to the mat every day gets sent home unless it's a non-elimination non league. And if you watched our show, you know that we knew those well. But nonetheless, um, when, when we came to U-Turn Parkinson's, we started fiddling around with different little hashtags and different little things we were working with. And a buddy of mine who's deep into marketing says to me one day, you've got your name because I'd been using this hashtag U-Turn PD for a long time. And he said, that's your name. That's what you want to do. You want to turn this around. You want to slow it down and hopefully one day eliminate it from life. Then I guess that's why you got your degree in marketing. So since then, we have been U-Turn Parkinson's with those goals. But when we started, we didn't want it to simply be a workout group. We didn't want to be a boxing club. We didn't want to be a cycling club. We didn't want to be this uni-focused thing. We wanted to be a wellness center because all of us, live such a different lives with Parkinson's. Not all of us want to go box. Not all of us want to go run. Not all of us want to go cycle. Not all, not all of us want to go be in art. We, we come to this disease and we live with this disease in such a multifaceted way that we wanted to holistically attack this, this disease and give our community the opportunity to be involved in the types of things that they are naturally drawn to and that will ultimately help them. So we said, how are we gonna, how are we gonna focus that? Well, we came across the National Institute for Wellness in the States, and it came across their definition of wellness. And uh, in, in a part of that, in, in that definition are these six spheres or focuses of wellness. The physical, obviously. We know that exercise is good for us with, with Parkinson's, hands down, don't ask, me to prove it don't ask me to to show you research stats it's that it, this is gospel long since past and the one proof i'll give you is to go to every parkinson's website you can find and find one that doesn't talk about the benefits of exercise with pd done no more nothing else left, left to be said right so physical occupational what do we need, mean by occupational occupational is uh, since i'm retired from nursing and busier now than I've ever been, is how we spend our day-to-day -day lives. Is it volunteering? Is it taking care of the grandkids? Is it, how do you spend your days? What do you fill them with? Intellectual, are we growing um, cognitively? Are we challenging ourselves cognitively? This morning in my, uh, my do a little thing every Friday morning called Coffee with Tim, Conversations of Life and Parkinson's, I, went, I ran through the books that are sitting on my nightstand right now. Are we challenging ourselves intellectually? Are we learning, are we growing, uh, moving in a positive direction with our minds? There's the emotional. Are we doing the same emotionally? Do we have the supports that we need emotionally? And thus we provide support groups and various things through U-Turn Parkinson's there. Then the social, along with that as well, and the spiritual. And the spiritual is often like, well, what do you do there? Well, that's a learning to ask the big questions. Those questions that we often don't like to talk about, you know, what do we think about life after death? How, how do we process our aging? How do we deal with the fact that at 55, I often feel more like 75 than I do 55? How do we process those things and all the while understanding and respecting the various beliefs that others have around? So that is um, the foundational aspect, if you will, of how we approach life um, from, um, yeah, at U-Turn Parkinson's. I'll leave it at that. That's great. Um, thank you so much for uh, highlighting all of those amazing things. And I really, I think the, the folks on the um, chat here have talked a lot about enjoying and appreciating the visuals because I think it's really helpful to to show the pyramid and show sort of the stages and I think that it's you know really resonating with a lot of the folks out there so so I really appreciate that 
Um, there's been a couple questions just about the practicalities of, you know, how to become an Avenger. It sounds like a couple of people have actually signed up while we've just been talking. So your 500 maybe uh, by the end of this call, I think, you know, we'll have more. But, um, you know, we'd love to find out, uh, people are asking about, you know, wh what is the process, um, you know, for, and I think Rochelle's kind of answered this in the quest in the chat as we talk about it, but how does one join the PD Avengers? What would be um, sort of uh, involved in the participating participation in this group? Um, you know, there's caregivers out there that want to get involved, but people want to know just about the practical kind of side of things and what you're hoping that each of these participants might be able to do. Maybe I'll ask that of, do you want to say Tim or Sonia, whoever? Sonia, go ahead. I was going to say you go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I, I'll, I'll take it. It's uh, quite easy to sign up where there's no, um, there's no signing in blood anywhere. There's no massive thing. It's your name, first and last name, and an email. That's all it takes, and you become a PD Avenger. The bar is very, very low, and I want to assure you of a few things. One, we're a little different than most things in the PD community in that we're not a charity. We're not going to come ask you for money. I know, let that sit, <laughs> but we're not. We may at times direct you to special events or funds or, or things that are going on that you might want to be a part of, but the PD Avengers ourselves are not a charity. We're not going to ask you for money all the time, if ever. Two, we're not going to spam you. We're not going to inundate your inbox with stuff and we're not going to sell your data. Our goal is to be able to stand together and make our voices known and in very specific, clear ways, speak to the broader world and community of the things that we need. So the entry point is very simple, very easy. And if you want to get involved beyond that, you most certainly can. There are committees that you can join. There are things that we're doing that need specific expertise. I'm looking for a web guru. If there's any um, website development gurus out there that want have some extra time and want to help us with ours, please give me a call. But that's the entry point. Pretty, pretty low, pretty easy. And we're not going to, we're not going to drive you crazy after that. Sonia, what would you add to that? Yeah, no, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the concerns that I've heard in the community have been that they're wondering about whether we fundraise, which again, as you said, we, we're not asking for any money. We're just asking for your support. And um, as far as emails go, the one thing we do plan on sending out is a monthly uh, update with about five calls to action, just five things that you can be aware of, five ways you can help support the cause the causes that we've taken up or the organizations that we are supporting. Um, and, and that's about it. It's really, you know, you can be involved as much as you want to be involved, but it's really about uniting as a community. It's really about stop, stopping work in our silos, supporting everybody, all organizations that are doing good work um, and, and supporting all researchers that are doing great work. So I, I think it's really about coming together as a, as a global community. I think just hearing sort of your message and seeing the social media that you guys have put out so far, I'm just really um, amazed at how quickly, I guess the pandemic has made people really stop and, and reflect a little bit, but I think because of the nature of being able to Zoom call in or these global sort of um, initiatives, I think have become a, a little easier to do. And I think this sort of concept of unifying and the global unification really, I, I've just been rather than asking for an individual, like I want my disease to be better treated here, I, I think this African initiative is just really amazing to me. And I think you, I just was on the Movement Disorder Society, um, our, our yearly conference is happening and it just, the opening ceremonies was today and they actually highlighted that. They, they have a new African um, uh, voice uh, on the movement disorder. They've, they've sort of broken Africa out into a separate country. You guys are already making differences and there's actually, you know, a lot of um, hopes. And we had Claudia Trenkwalder on uh, this, who's a, the, the president elect of our society. And, you know, she's talking about this now. So I think already there's sort of these, um, you know, causes are, are being noticed and by the communities, the research communities, the, the provider medical communities out there. So I think great work. And I think, you know, I think that the, the fact that 
you have this book with these specific missions with the ending Parkinson's, you know, stop using paraquat. I mean, let's get, uh, you know, medicines to every nation in Africa that we can, you know, that these are relatively, you know, simple things, but kind of mind blowing that we still haven't been able to accomplish some of those steps. I think, you know, I, I commend you for just coming up with, you know, relatively what I think is low hanging fruit, hopefully to accomplish as the first missions. And then, you know, once you build some momentum, um, I think hopefully we can continue to work all of us together, um, doctors, you know, nurses, everyone who cares about people with Parkinson's to really make a difference. Um, and I think that the fact that, um, you know, we're trying to break down these silos because it's sometimes so many different little organizations all doing similar things. And, you know, I think if we all work together, we can really kind of get the message out, which is why, you know, I wanted to have you guys on here and hopefully we can take this video and share it widely with anybody and out there and, and we can really kind of get the message out and increase the PD Avengers. But I've really been excited about your, your mission already. Um, the fact that you, you said two words just in the, in the beginning too that really resonated with me. So, well, the first two words I already used was global and unity, which I think are, are important. But then patient-centered and holistic are something that I've really been a lot about, you know, just in my um, work as a Parkinson's doc, I think so much of what we do doesn't really impact patients that much. We talk about, you know, changing tremor or something like that, uh, moving a needle, you know, 5% with this medication. And I think what I've been really opening my mind to and my eyes to is how much these sort of sometimes healthcare disparities, sometimes social, um, you know, factors which impact our patients. You know, if you're lonely, if you're, um, you know, if you happen to be of a certain, um, you know, live in a certain place, you can't get access to medication or, or have, um, you know, a certain sort of ethnic background, you know, we, we aren't focusing on you. Or if you're a woman with Parkinson's, we aren't focusing on you. You know, there's just a lot of disparities out there. And we haven't really addressed in our mainstream um, research and, and, you know, work and even patient care day to day, the things that really matter to patients. So I think hopefully we can work together to highlight those. And I think, you know, you showed that advocacy pyramid and it came up in the chat. Um, I think one of, you know, sort of the after acceptance, there's these, you know, bars that are, you know, up to the top of the pyramid. And I think a lot of that has to do with purpose um, as well, sort of finding a sense of purpose and empowering oneself to move forward with the journey. So maybe we could speak a little bit about purpose because I think that that is honestly just seeing your work um, so much of what drives you is clearly a sense of purpose. I wanted to know when, what, what sort of was the game changer, do you think, in your own um, diagnosis pyramid or whatever it is uh, that we, we can speak from, uh, where you went from, you know, sort of that, that you, you said you spent 10 years, Sonia, for example, in that, you know, area that was down here. But then, um, you know, as you, what, what was the game changer that sort of took something that could have been quite a negative sort of situation in your own life and changed it clearly into something that is, you both use the word passion too, which I think is pretty interesting that you picked that word. And I think passion and purpose are what I would define both of you with. So maybe tell me about that, that switch. Sure. Um, for me, it really wasn't, I'm, I'm a slow learner <laughs> overall. So for me, it was a slow change. It didn't come about, you know, after reading one thing or, or seeing somebody say, you know, a movie of some sort, or it, it wasn't like an epiphany like that. For me, it was a, a recognition of the slow decline I was going on, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. I was letting it consume me. My thoughts were all about the disability I was having. The fact the, the glass was always half empty. It was never half full. And it, Objectively, if I looked at my life, I had three beautiful children, healthy children, a very supportive husband, a really supportive uh, family and social circle, a busy family practice, you know, a good career. So I really didn't have in my objective mind a reason to feel as low and as down and as, um, as overwhelmed as I was feeling. And it became apparent to me that I was sort of had a choice. The Parkinson's disease diagnosis was not going to change, but how I faced the challenges that that disease brought into my life, that was mine to determine. So then I began to choose. And it seems like, you know, it seems like such an easy thing to say, and it is a very difficult thing to do, but I began to choose hope, to choose to be optimistic about the future, to 
And that sort of was freeing for me. I, I didn't have to be a glass half empty person. I could be a glass half full if I chose to be. And on, that doesn't mean on days I'm not glass half empty. Trust me, there are lots of days that I will wake up and think, wow, this is not a good day. But overall, I have hope for the future. I, I have no choice but to move forward for my children. Um, I have to be productive. I have I have to fight for our community. I mean, to be honest with you, anything I do in terms of my advocacy work, any time I devote is really, I can say truly not for me. I'm not why me anymore. I'm more like why not me. This, this work in advocacy and, and working with the community and trying my level best to do what I can has become a passion for me. And I know it's a passion for Tim as well. So as I said, it was more of a, a slow, slow learning, a slow, um, introspective kind of journey for me that that changed things yeah can, can I ask you a question sure sure uh, I I dove in fairly quickly um, on, honestly not because I necessarily wanted to because it took me a little bit by, by surprise but um, running the race being on the amazing race I, I suddenly found myself talking about parkinson's and the fact that i have parkinson's because i've put myself in this position and got accepted and so suddenly i'm just out there and i'm actually in truth enjoying the attention and whatnot but it wasn't until afterwards that i realized kind of what had happened and you you kind of wake up from this event and you're like oh we have been thrust into this very different place that i never dreamt being and so then I had to figure myself out, what, what am I going to do? How do I, how do I manage this? And I've had this genetic problem, I've called it from birth, where I, I consider myself a little bit of an entrepreneur and I can't stop, stop starting businesses. <laughs> so um, the, the very next thing was, well, I've got, to, I've got to do something about this because not only do I like working with people, not only do I like starting businesses, but I'm a nurse. I am a nurse. I continue to be a nurse. I won't have, don't have a license anymore, but at heart, I am a nurse. And so I want to help people. That's what I do. And so it became very clear that this was my call. This is what I've been put here to do, if you will. I wasn't given um, cardiac disease. I wasn't given cancer. I wasn't given ALS. There were lots of things I wasn't given. I was given Parkinson's. So I came to the conclusion, and I talk about this a lot in my book, Perseverance, that um, this, this is my thing. This is what I was put on the planet to do, uh, to do what my best, to live my best, to focus as well as I can on being a guy with a glass half full versus half empty like Sonia and do my thing for Parkinson's. And so I took off with that. And the more, the deeper I get into it, the more I realize the inequities that exist within Parkinson's. I mean, why are we doing this today in English only? we should be doing this in several languages. When you, I have traveled all across North America I, and Canada. I have spoken to multi, dozens and dozens and dozens of different um, events, conferences, et cetera, et cetera. They're always in English and they're always predominantly of one cultural arrangement, if you will. We do not do a good job of reaching out broader and we have to figure that out. We have to figure that out, not only in North America, but we've got to make sure that folks in South America have access to the information, medication, and resources that we have, that people in Asia have access, that people in Africa have access, because there are hundreds of thousands of people who are, not li who are living without the very fundamental basics that we have taken for granted for years. I mean, we, we want so much more than what they can even dream of having because they don't have just the fundamental pieces and basic information, basic medication, basic physical therapies that the rest of us in North America take so for granted. And yes, you can see this is a bit of a passion for me. So I every now and then have to ratchet it down. <laughs> but I am so I am so in love with what we're doing with PD Avengers because it is, it is giving me that outlet. It is, I see light at the end of the tunnel that we as people living with Parkinson's disease can actually change the course of our disease on our planet if we choose to. We can do this. Absolutely.
Well, and it's very cute to watch you guys and all of you actually, because even corresponding with Rochelle and Ben, like every time I ask one of you to talk about yourselves or whatever, but you end up talking about another person in the group. It's very cute. Like Ben was talking about, you know, Omotola and like Rochelle's talking about Sonia. It's like, you know, and you both are talking about each other. It's just very sweet. I mean, I think to watch fellow human beings um, caring so deeply about something that I'm also very passionate about, but then also lifting each other up so tremendously um, and, and cheering each other on is just sort of a beautiful thing for me to see, honestly. Um, so so I, I so appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, so we have so much we could talk about. So one thing that I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about is, is your guys' concepts of self-care. Um, I know both of you are very into the exercise mission and the lifestyle, sort of living a healthy lifestyle. And um, I, as most people know, have a yoga teacher background and, and have gotten really interested in meditation and things like that. Maybe you could just teach us a little bit about that and how that's impacted your wellness and the holistic kind of approach that you're sort of using to treating, you know, this, this disease. Uh, uh, Sonia? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that a holistic approach is really the only approach. Until there's a cure and better treatments, it's all about quality of life for patients. And what defines my quality of life will be different from yours. But overall, self-care is important in achieving anybody's quality of life. There are variables that we don't have control over with this disease, but there are variables that we do have control over. And it's important to take control of those variables in order to live well. And that means looking at your diet, looking at your stress level, looking at how much you're sleeping or able to sleep, looking at your exercise routine. Routine in general for me, and I think for a lot of people that I know in the community is really key. Routine in terms, not just of your medication and your appointments, but routine in terms of your daily routine. I personally always start off with, with exercise and, and that can be yoga, um, it can be Pilates or something cardio, but every morning I wake up and I do an hour of that before my kids wake up and before the day gets started, that's just me. Um, I also follow it up with some quiet time and some may call that meditation, others may call it rest or relaxation, and then I get my day started. And I find personally for me that having that set routine, set space and time in my mind and in my schedule to, to take care of what I need allows me to move more, um, more successfully through my day and handle all the challenges that come my way. So um, exercise, including things like yoga, particularly from a stretching perspective and a strength perspective, yoga has been great for me. Because I think we have to remember that this disease makes us smaller, it makes us sort of contract in and we need those kind of opening poses and opening um, types of exercises, strengthening exercises that allow us to, to feel better. Um, and it's also very good for balance, which, which has been um, another key um, thing that I've noticed has improved. Great. How about you, Tim? I would have to echo very much what Sonia has said. Um, routine is so crucial for me. If I get out of routine, it just blows everything apart. Um, I just, so what I try to do, I've got a very specific routine that I've laid out for every day of the week that I should get up and do either yoga or as I call it sometimes stretching and strengthening because guys don't do yoga right but we'll do stretch and strengthening <laughs> and so I, I've got three days a week that I do that Monday Wednesday Friday generally that's about an hour just short of an hour and then uh, Tuesday Thursdays I could go to the gym it's uh, basically a hit training we call it rock steady boxing but it's basically a high intensity uh, interval training and uh, then I try to get out on my bike a couple times a week and I'm trying to get my running going back again so I mean that sounds like lots right that sounds like, and a lot of people will say I'm out of your mind I'm not doing that that's fine you don't have to do all that that's that's me that's what I enjoy but the important thing is structure is consistency and I like to say the secret sauce for me is stretching it is so huge I walk better, I move better, I feel so much better when I stretch uh, that if, I, and I've always said, if I had to give up everything that I do for Parkinson's from a physical standpoint and it could only keep one thing, it would be my yoga because it provides the strength and the flexibility that I need to, to just function better. 
So that's my big piece. And then like Sonia said as well, uh, I try to spend the time every day in, in meditation. I come from a Christian tra tradition. So I, I spend time in some memorization work and just meditation from that perspective. And it helps keep your, my head straight. And uh, then reading and other stuff. I work really hard at getting out of Parkinson's because so much of what I do is based on Parkinson's, revolves around Parkinson's. And I see it in my family. When I get too involved, which I have a tendency to do, then it stresses my family. And so I have to work at getting my head out of Parkinson's from time to time and into something else. That's great. Um, I've been asking, you know, some, some folks, and I hope to ask each of the Avengers um, maybe for um, some pearls or a nugget of, of something uh, in, a, in a certain type of question. I wanted to ask you both, if you were to talk now with all the knowledge that you know, having lived you know, in this body with this uh, disease for these, this many years, to give some advice to your younger self upon diagnosis or upon you know, sort of the, the earliest journeys um, with this, what would you say to yourself, Sonia? Um, if I may indulge you, I had written something a long time ago that was titled to my newly diagnosed self. I'll just read you the last couple of paragraphs just because that kind of summarizes what, I, what I'm feeling. Um, to my newly diagnosed self, you may not feel it at the moment, but Parkinson's will be your ultimate blessing, not the curse as you see it. That facing this challenge will teach you humility, empathy, and strength. That it will force you to live in the moment, to take nothing for granted. That it will not defeat you as you may now believe, but instead be the very element that causes you to thrive. To my new, newly diagnosed self, no one really knows what life will bring. At some point, you have to abandon your fear of the future and begin living your present. To my newly diagnosed self, stop living in such angst. I know what the future holds for you and you're ready to face it head on. So I wrote that at a time where I had sort of changed into um, more the glass half full. And uh, it was a, a, a time of, of real self-empowerment. And for me, this is, has been a physical challenge, but it's also been a, a mental and emotional and spiritual one. And that's, that's why those you know, few words really express what I, what I feel. Um, just before you go to, on to, um, yeah, I've been reading some of the work that, or I, I don't know if they'd be sort of mini essays or on your blog, but they're really beautiful, Sonia, and I would urge um, a lot of people to go there because I think it's not just about this journey that you're on, but it sort of speaks to, I think, the journey that every person on this planet is on in some, somewhere or the other. So, or is struggling with something or the other that they may have in their lives. So it's really beautiful advice. And I, I think in some ways, uh, I don't know, I've, I've been told that I've missed my calling as being maybe the Oprah of Parkinson's hosting, but um, I think you missed calling in some ways and hopefully you're getting back to it with this writing. It sounds like, I don't know, how, mu how much writing do you do? Do you do a lot of journaling? Is that part of your your day-to-day -day, um, meditative sort of time or? Yeah, I, I've been so involved with other projects, though, that I've I've neglected to do that. But I have to get back into that because I think that creative process is really um, empowering for me, and I, I've got to get back into it. But um, I, yeah, that's something I have to return to doing more of. You're really gifted at it, I would say, because I, I do read a lot, and I, you know, enjoyed reading those. So, that's and uh, we're, we're linking some of those here on your un unshakable. MD.com website. Sorry, Tim. Now, now you're saying same, same question. Oh, you that is very all right, and I agree with you. Sonia has done some fantastic work, and it's very encouraging. I have been exploring, um, if you will, the dark side, <laughs> as I keep saying. Uh, I am typically a, a pretty upbeat person. I, I don't tend to uh, tend to spend a lot of time down in the dumps, but I have felt for a long time that I have kind of, in some ways skimmed across the top of Parkinson's in many ways and have left out those others. And I've, I've started exploring what others are, are really going through. What are their feelings? What are, what, are, what are happening with folks? I've got friends who are in their 40s, early 50s who are struggling desperately with Parkinson's. Their Parkinson's does not look anything like mine. Mine looks nothing like theirs. 
and how very, very hard their lives really are. And I haven't shared any of these writings yet because they're dark. <laughs> My wife doesn't necessarily like them yet, but I think if to answer your question, to go back and uh, what would I say to my four newly diagnosed 46 year old self? I actually just wrote a foreword for a book uh, by a gentleman named called John Braddock that answers this very question. Um, and I, I wouldn't read it for you today yet because I'm not ready to, but it's, it's about, I, I start the, the forward by saying two words, you're screwed. Because I never looked at how difficult Parkinson's really can be. And I went back and I explored again, these friends and acquaintances that I have who live such very difficult lives and started asking myself, what do they need? What, what does their world look like? Because my world looks nothing like theirs. I have had a very easy ride with Parkinson's thus far compared to so many. And so I've uh, begun to explore, you know, what, what do I need to be saying and doing on their behalf? Uh, and I wish that I had done that a little bit more from the get-go. Instead of spending so much time on my positive, but also spending time digging into and dwelling on their negatives. Because they really have been massively different. And I, I don't want to leave them out anymore. Wow, that's really profound. Um, yeah, I mean, as a doctor who takes care of patients with this, uh, we see, you know, all kinds of people or pe people with this and they're the people that love them and care about them. I mean, my journey for 20 years as a doctor has been to hold hands and be a shoulder to cry on and, you know, laugh with my patients and enjoy all of their, you know, ups and downs in their life. And it's been a really beautiful journey, but um, I agree. I think, uh, you know, I think, some of the things that I've been reflecting on are truly gratitude practices. And, and I think one of the things that I realized is that, you know, so much of what brings me joy, maybe what drew me to medicine is helping others. And, and so maybe that journey, and maybe you could speak a bit about, you know, I think each of you comes from a healthcare background. Um, what is that maybe, because those, that I think you out of the two Avengers are, well, Michelle's in, in, in sort of a also health related field. Um, but what, what do you think has, in some ways, is a positive aspect of having that healthcare background or maybe even a, a negative aspect maybe to approaching this disease with that healthcare background? Sonia? Um, knowledge is both a positive and a negative, <laughs> I would say. Having the me medical background has helped me at times to identify, for instance, what a symptom is versus a side effect from medication, how to manage my medications and that sort of thing. And it's also been a negative because oftentimes I, you know, my mind might go to places where it shouldn't go. You know, the, there's a common saying in medicine, you might've heard that, you know, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, but my mind always goes to zebras at times. And that's sort of one of the downsides of having that medical knowledge. But I think one thing that really gave me, especially when I was in practice, was that empathy. You know, when people came in, they were no longer the, the person with high blood pressure. They were no longer the person with diabetes. They were no longer the person with cancer. They were the person, the person whose cancer affected them globally, not just physically, but through their family relationships, through socially, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, that we have to look at the patient as a whole. And, and that is really something now that now when I when I see people in my Parkinson's community, I don't just view it as oh they're this stage of Parkinson's or they're that you know far along in their disease. I look more at them as the whole person, and I think that um, it's it benefited me both when I was in practice and, and now what I do as well is, is that holistic uh, approach to a person. Tim, I would agree very much uh, the same. Knowledge is both a blessing and a curse. I am way too tuned in to what my body is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, <laughs> I, I, I self-diagnosed my Parkinson's. I, I know what's going on in my body, and that's probably a little neurotic, quite, quite honestly. <laughs> so it, it helps in some ways, but in some ways it's just bad, because some days it can get you into a real hole if you let it, because you know where things could go. And so you got to fight to stay out of that. But it does help 
to um, in the broader conversation to give a medical perspective, um, a, a nursing perspective, if you will, in caring for people and how we can do that maybe better than we might have otherwise and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I think Sonia said a lot of it well. I would agree with a lot of what she said. I don't think I would expand a lot more. Okay. Well, as we had guessed, this hour is pretty much blown by um, and uh, we barely scratched the surface. I think I wrote an email to you both with like 20 things each that we could talk about, each of which could take an episode of this. Um, and I'd love to continue the conversation. Um, you know, certainly Sonia, your, your work in, you know, being a woman with Parkinson's and parenting and things um, really, you know, would be very important for the rest of the audience to hear. And Tim, your advocacy around so much with the exercise and the U-turn, and I mean, we could talk about that and your book, The Seven, the seven uh, things that you talk about in your book are, are just fascinating to me. Um, were some were quite surprising actually, um, but you, you know, so interesting, uh, honestly. So I'd love to have you each come on for another hour again. So I will give you each now just, um, cause this is just the beginning of the conversation and the beginning of the marathon that we'll be on together. Um, you know, us as, as people who care for you and you who are in it knee deep with us, uh, who care for you, um, all holding hands together with this global voice and hopefully uniting and breaking down silos and not just Dr. Subramanian and, you know, everybody else, you know, it's like these titles, but just people together, you know, fighting a fight. That's what I really hope for this and wanted to, to give you a platform to voice this so that we could speak on it together. Um, so maybe just a couple of minutes uh, just to wrap up a, 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 a sort of voice um, of hope or an inspiration, maybe just the last couple of minutes. Uh, maybe Sonia, you could start. Sure. Um, I remember early in my journey with Parkinson's disease, people would ask me, so what's happening? What are they working on? What are they doing? When is it cure going to come? And I, I would sort of answer with, well, they're working on it. And it took a little while for me to understand that they includes us. It includes us as patients. Without our involvement, without our advocacy, without our, our passion to get things done, things won't get done. Without us participating in clinical trials, for instance, there can be no better treatments or a cure. We are needed. We need to partner with our research community. We need to partner with our clinical community in order to get this done. And it can be done. We've, as Tim mentioned earlier in, in his talk, we, you know, we've, we've done so much. We've made HIV a chronic illness, not a death sentence anymore. You know, we've, we've cured the world of polio. There's so much that we as human beings can achieve Parkinson's is one of those things that we can achieve, but we need to work together. We need to work together on a global level in order to get that done. And I'm hopeful for the future. Awesome. Jim, and, and I, would encourage, I would encourage everyone to pick up a word that I use often. It, it is the title of my book, but it's the word perseverance. And perseverance means this, to carry on in your course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. To carry on in your course of action, even in the face of difficulty, even when there doesn't look like there's a shred of hope that you will ever be successful. And to persevere is way different than don't give up, don't give in, hold on, hang in there. It's about seven practical steps that you can take that are positive, that take us somewhere. Perseverance it doesn't sit at home and pout. It gets up and says, I'm going to build my community. It doesn't sit, sit back and say, what, what was me? What can I do? It says, I'm going to take the advantage that I've been given today to do something. And today the advantage is PD Adventures. It's going to act on things that come into our lives that say, I can do this. I can do this thing. It may not change the world, but it will change my world. And it may change the world of one individual. That's what it means to persevere. So I'd encourage you to, to grab hold of a great big word that we don't use very often and that sometimes we have a hard time getting our hands around, but to figure it out and to learn that we can do this. We can change our world because we are people who are motivated by this disease because we have this disease and that together we can make our world a way better place because we chose to stand together, let our voices be heard, and to employ our super superpowers as Parkinson PD Avengers. 
<laughs> Absolutely. We're going to all grab our uh, masks and capes and put them on together. Um, I agree. I've been a doctor for 20 something years. I think we're going to kick this in the ass, seriously. So together though, it has to be together. And um, I think the time is right. So let's do it together. We'll work with you. We're, we're working with you hand in hand. So, so, um, so, so much, so much great feedback in the chat. I think we're going to try to um, continue. Like I said, the marathon is not going to be a sprint. We're going to be in it together and I'm going to keep hosting these and you know, we'll, we'll have, uh, I think, five more of these with different Avengers on in the next month and a half. Um, people are asking for links, so hopefully the PMB Alliance can get um, enough information out there. We'll maybe even link some of these um, on other medias and possibly on your website so people can watch and learn a little bit as well. So, but I just wanted to thank you both so much for the work that you're doing and the work that you've done and the work that we will do in advance. So, um, and I appreciate you taking the time and, uh, Yes, together we will end Parkinson's disease. I, I truly, I think we'll be looking back on this series being like, oh, remember when we taped that? Like, <laughs> whenever it'll be down the road and we'll have these, you know, these uh, uh, videos and we'll, we'll look back on it hopefully and, and raise a toast to those times when we thought that it was far away. You know, the cure Wouldn't that be cool, eh? Yeah, absolutely. We'll be people sitting in the nursing home going, remember when we had Parkinson's? <laughs> Yeah. We wanted to get yeah. rid of it so bad, but we finally did. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So, well, thank you, fellow Canadians, for um, being on this series with me. And uh, thank you, I really you. appreciate your advocacy. And PD Avengers, we're going to fight it and Parkinson's. So, um, I will head it back to you guys. Um, and Anissa, are you going to say good goodbye, Wade? Absolutely. So, thank you so much, Sonia, Tim, and Dr. Subramanian. It was fantastic. We do have another uh, PD Avenger program on the 18th um, on the creative side, creative and positive side of Parkinson's. So tune in for that. And until then, let's say our goodbyes and wave to everyone. Thank you friends for joining us. It was so great to see you. Happy Friday. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.